that's been for the Lord on my side. Everywhere would I be? Oh, where would I be? Let's do that again. I want to talk a few minutes about how to get authentic joy. So that comes from 1 Thessalonians 1 through 10, Brother JB. And so if you can put that scripture up for me, um, 1 Thessalonians 1 through 10, and we'll take a few moments to give you a chance to find it there. Or we'll, huh? Uh, First Thessalonians 1, I'm sorry. 1, 1 through 10. First Thessalonians 1, 1 through 10. All right. So let's read it together. It says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Acacia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. And so we're going to take a look at, like we said, how to get authentic joy. Let me ask you something. Have you ever gone to functions where when you get ready to go in or have you ever gone to somebody's house and you enter there and there's somebody at the door to greet you and they're like, hey, how you doing? 
come on in. You know, have a seat over here. They'll be with you in just a little bit. You know, and so by looking at the body, body language and the sound of the voice, you know good and well they don't mean it, right? You know they don't mean it. They're there because they have to be. Now, contrast that to somebody that says when you came, it's like, hey, how you doing? We are so glad to, man, we've been waiting on you. Come on over here and have a seat. Look, there's some punch over there. We got some groceries on the table. Just have yourself a good time. Sit on down. We'll be with you in a minute. You see the difference? Now, the first one, I'd turn around and just leave and go right on out. But the second one, I mean, this person greeted me with joy in their hearts. And you could hear it in their voices and you could see it in their actions. And so there's a difference. You see, most of us can be polite and friendly when we have to. But the Christ in us ought to say that we ought to be polite and friendly all the time, all the time, not just because we have to be, but we ought to be that way because we want to be. Folks know the difference between that plastic high, you know, hi, how you doing? Come on in, have a seat. Sounds like I'm trying to think what well, was one of the TV show right there that lady be on, on the telephone. Hey, come on, come on in, have a sit down, have a sit down. You know, it's like, oh, my goodness. You know, it's like, and, and that's kind of what that plastic sounds like. It's like, don't even bother. But then that second greeting says, you want me here. You're glad that I'm here. See, we can't manufacture genuine joy. But, but, but when we have the love of Christ in us, we'll display genuine joy because we're consumed with the gospel and the love of Christ. So it just compels us. Paul lets us know in this scripture that we stand before God as holy ones who are recipients of his unmerited favor and our lives with God as well and as well as everything else is all ordered by God. OK, we're, we're living in a harmony both physically and spiritually because of God ordering our steps. So now Pastor Pitts and the church leadership and I, we have the confidence that SBC in Santa Ana and SBC here at Lake Forest will continue to grow in faith and in size because we put in the work. We put in the work. You see, there is a foundation that has been built. So when you look and you think about what Paul says here about how could he be so confident? How could he be so confident that the church is going to thrive and it's going to continue to, to grow because of that work that was put in, because of the work we're doing right now? We've got that solid foundation upon which to stand. And so the first thing is, is that when we see joy, when we talk about joy, our joy stems from the heart. Paul knew that, and I imagine that when he was with them, you know, he put these young, uh, these young converts through some paces. You know, you know Ron, you and, and Shannon and some of the rest of us, some of the ladies in here too, some of you all have played sports, right? So you know in sports to get ready and to stay ready, you got to go through conditioning drills. You got to go through conditioning drills. And in those conditioning drills, Miss Nancy, I remember when I was playing football, we had to run wind sprints. Man, we ran wind sprints one day. I remember we lost the game. We weren't supposed to lose. We lost that game. And he said, for every point they scored, you're going to run a 50-yard wind sprint. They scored 25 points on us. <laughs> we had to run 25 50-yard wind sprints, Sam. By the time we got, we were like, ugh, ugh, you know, we, I mean, you don't, I tell you what, that was the highest scoring game. Nobody else scored that much on us again. <laughs> All right? Now, we might have lost another game, but they didn't score that many points. Because I think we lost that one 25, 24, something like that. It's like you're going to run a sprint for every one. And so we're all spiritual athletes. You know, we're going through this through these conditioning drills. And, and, and so you run wind sprints. But then, you know, the Sam, they got you doing stadium steps uh, when you played basketball. You know, if you played basketball, you had to do line drills, line drills. Look, I see some of the ladies nodding. They're like, yeah, you hate, did you hate line drills? I hated line drills. And when, when the coach would holler, get on the line, you knew what was coming. Why? Because they knew in that game, you're going to have to run. You're going to have to run. If you watch the, the, the last NBA championships, boy, by the time some of these guys like this, whew, 
you know, see, poor conditioning. But see, he put you on that line and you start on one line and you go part of the way and you go back and then you go to the quarter of the court and you go back and you go to half court and you go back. And, you go. and it's like, why are we doing this? But when you got in the heat of the game, your conditioning kicked in. Your conditioning kicked in, see. And so we want to be sure that when we get in this game of life, the reason you're sitting here now and the reason we go through all this, the reason we have Bible studies and the reason that we support one another is it's the conditioning of the heart. So when the times get tough, when things get strong, you see, that conditioning kicks in. You see, and, and, and so Coach used to tell us, he said, hey, he said, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. You look, at, I, I see somebody nodding their head. They've heard that. The going gets tough, the tough gets going. He said, I want players with heart. If you don't have heart, you're no good to the team. You got to have heart. In this game, we're battling for souls, folks. We're battling for souls. We're, we're, we're battling for our own soul, and the condition of our heart can help us through the most difficult situations. And it's also going to make the difference whether we win others for Christ who walk through that door, not only who walk through the door, but who we meet. See, the condition of the heart, one author says it's important to remember this. He said it's important to remember that there are three elements that define the church. The first one is that the church is a fellowship born in a world divided racially, culturally and socially. I'll say that again. The church was born in a world that was already divided racially, culturally and socially. But it was different. The church was different. Why? Because the church was poor in money, but it was rich in friendship. And the church says, he, the author says it was a brotherhood that was not merely uh, characteristic, but it was a brotherhood who friendship and fellowship was its essence. Okay? I don't have much money, but I got a sandwich. And I'll split this sandwich with you, Shannon. You hungry? Me too. I don't have much money, but we can get the water, some water out the water fountain. We can split this sandwich. See, Sa Shannon's going to remember that. Larry didn't have but just a, a half a sandwich, and we split that in quarters. All right? I had a quarter, and he had a quarter. And, but he's going to remember that. And then secondly, what the author says is that the church is a fellowship around a person. Now, what does that mean? It means the person is Jesus Christ. See, the church is built around a person. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches in John 15 and 5. Fellowship in the congregation is depending upon fellowship with the head. See, if I don't have a fellowship with the Lord and Jesus Christ, I certainly can't have fellowship with you. Can I, Pastor Sarge, can I have a fellowship with you? If I don't have a see, I, I want you to remember, I want you to remember something. See, our fellowship goes two ways. As we said, that fellowship is horizontal. You remember that? That fellowship is horizontal and it, it, it is vertical rather. It's vertical and it's what? Horizontal. It's vertical because we have a relationship with Jesus Christ and it's horizontal because we have a relationship with one another. And if any part of that, this part, is just as important as this part. And this forms what? A cross, right? So if I break this part, I'm breaking the cross. I'm breaking for what I stand for, what I'm supposed to stand for. So if I can't hold on to that part, then I have not kept God's promises that he has and his desires for me. And so, uh, you know, the church, though, he says, where there are two or three gathered in my name, Jesus is going to be in the midst, right? It's the fellowship around that person, Jesus, and it's not constituted by how many folks you have, but it's constituted by the relationship to the leader and to the Lord and to one another, right? Our relationship to the pastor, our relationship to one another, and our relationship to the Lord, that's what the church, is. the fellowship is built around. And then there's a fellowship around a person who can give it the shepherd's heart. Now, we know it's built around the person who is Jesus Christ, but it's also built around the person who can give it the shepherd's heart. That serving hand, that desire to be able to help others, uh, that burden bearing uh, uh, capability so that if my if 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 my neighbor is suffering, so I can go over and help you share that burden. I can cry with you. I can pray with you. And see, that's what the church is all about. The concern of the church is with all of life. We have a responsibility for all of the world. And remember that the battle stamina and the work that we put in now, it depends upon proper heart conditioning. 
See, I got to condition my heart. That's what we're going through is heart conditioning. If my heart is not conditioned, then I'm subject to stand at the door and say, no, you can't come in here. You're not dressed right. You see, in here, in here, see, we get dressed. We get dressed up. And see, you got on tennis shoes and you got on pants. Uh-oh, that's what I got on, tennis shoes. And, and you got on slacks. You don't have, you're not suited down. You can't come here. But the heart says, come as you are. Welcome. Come on in here. We want you in here. Come on in. That's what the heart says, see. And so we have that shepherd's heart. It depends upon that hard condition. And, th and then when we looked at that scripture in verses four through six, the foundation on which we stand is our salvation in Jesus Christ. Our salvation in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So now the players are standing with the coaches on a common ground. At first, now we at first we, we recruited you. You were trying out. You see, you was trying to see. But now. You see, you've gone through the conditioning drills and you've made it. So now I can call you team. See, if I'm on your team, I can call you my brother. Right. I can call you my brother. I can call you my sister because we're on the same team fighting for the same cause. And Paul calls them brothers and sisters who have been chosen for the task. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's a common practice among groups to achieve that status. All right. Shannon and, 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 and I, you know, and, uh, you know, JB, we're in a fraternity. So we're fraternity brothers. They're uh, folks who are probably in a sorority and they're sorors or they're sorority sisters. If you belong to the Masons, you know, you're a member of the Masonic Lodge. Oh, that's my Masonic brother over there. You see, there's just a natural thing that once you become a team, you get elevated to a certain status. So instead of becoming a prospect, now you become a brother. Or a sister. Does that make sense? In other words, you become part of the family. And so Paul knew and, and as well. We know that with the certainty that when you're properly trained, you can make it. And so uh, uh, we're reminded that 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 with the gospel that we preach to you and the teaching that we give through you is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when we preach with conviction and when we preach with with authority, you know it is. And, and so. You see and you feel the truth that's in the gospel. And he said up there, he said, you know that we are what we stood for when he was talking about we absolutely believed in the gospel of Christ. And, you know, if I'm standing before you, that if I'm speaking with an authority, if I'm speaking with a conviction, then, you know, I believe in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I believe in his word and what it's saying. And so that's what happens with us. The assurance of salvation gives us a true and authentic joy that's immediately detectable to everybody. You, you, you know what? You know, other folks want that same joy. When you start, when you start, Brother Mickey, when you start uh, uh, exuding joy, when you start talking about Jesus Christ and you get happy, all of a sudden you be telling, Woo, let me tell you what he's done for me. Folks be like, Ooh, I want some of that. You know, I want some of that. I, 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 where, where can I get some of that? You want to get some of this? Come on with me. Let me take you right on over here to 22600 Lambert, where you come in, because over there, boy, it's full of joy over there. It's full of joy. And that's where you get it. So, so, so now, uh, 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 you know, you know they're, they're wondering when you're at work, Brother, Brother Safar, they're, they're wondering when you're at work. They're saying, well, how is it Safar working all these hours and this brother's still smiling? You know, he's still smiling. Or how is it when somebody got mad, you know, and they said something to you they shouldn't have, you just say, well, I'm going to just pray for you. You know, they wonder, well, how come you're not getting mad? How come you're not getting upset? Because we have a joy that allows us to overcome those situations. So what, are the, what does that joy look like? Well, there are three characteristics. The first is that authentic joy doesn't wax and wane with the circumstances. It doesn't grow and it doesn't get diminished. And it doesn't diminish with the circumstances. See, we tend to associate joy with what's going on during our day. Now, if my day is not going well, we say, well, I don't have much joy right now. Well, no, don't confuse that with happiness. See, you don't have much happiness right then because happiness is tied on to what's going on around you. Joy is deeper than that. It's not defined by any sentiment or, or emotion. It doesn't rise and fall with our circumstances. The source of our joy is God and God alone. 
and the, the, the relationship that we have with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we accept him, that's our joy. It doesn't matter what's going on around us. And then there's this other thing that says authentic joy is more solid and stable than the rising sun. Now, you can't get much more solid and stable than that. You know, because I can believe that the sun is going to come up every morning, Sister Verlian. You know, and it's pretty stable. And so, but, but joy comes from God. And Psalms 18, 2 and 3 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my strength in whom I will trust. He's my buckler and the horn of my salvation in my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. So we have that type of confidence that our true source of joy will always be there. It's not going anywhere. It's like that sun rising and setting. Therefore, we are never without hope. Now, the third thing, authentic joy is not found in immediate gratification, but you got to push past. You got to push past the immediate gratification. What do we mean there? So we've seen that joy is much deeper than happiness. We just established that, right? So as Christians, we've got to set our sights on eternal rewards and not this earthly stuff. So we got to push past this earthly stuff. Now, there's nothing wrong with with having some of the earthly pleasures of life. But but immediate gratification, that immediate gratification can have some serious uh, 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 consequences and some serious implications. So we should treasure the Lord Jesus Christ most of all. And when he is our treasure, we will commit our resources our money, our time, our talents, all of that to work in his battlefield. Does that make sense? Paul advises us that, that God had an eternal reward for those who were motivated to serve Christ. He said, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And that's in Colossians 3. 23 and 24. So when we live sacrificially for Jesus Christ's sake and we serve him by serving the body of Christ, our, our brothers and sisters, we store up our treasures in heaven. In other words, what he's saying is you have an obligation. All of us have an obligation to serve Miss Nancy, our brothers and sisters. We have an obligation to look out for them. We have an obligation to help them. We have an obligation to be a support for them. Three things that we need to remember and then I'm done. All right. The first is that remember what we deserve. Entitlement can be an enemy to joy. I, I, I didn't know what entitlement looked like until I came back to California. I mean, I kind of was I kind of was exposed to it a little bit. But you really start to see it out here amongst a lot of the young folks out here. They have a sense of entitlement. That you don't and most young folks do, but it's more prevalent out here because still down south and in the Midwest, you got some of the old values that say, well, I don't care what the law say, I'll whoop your behind. All right. They still do that down there. But you get a sense of entitlement out here. You know, I'm entitled to have that. You ain't entitled to have nothing, nothing unless you work for it. OK, but the, but there's this system. And so we, we begin to think and then some of us grown folks are the same way. We begin to think that. We deserve better than what we get. But that's what gets us in trouble. We should remember that the only thing that we rightfully deserve is a spiritual death. But God took care of that when he sent his son Jesus, right, to die for us, that we might have that right to eternal life. So the second thing we say is remember what you have. Comparison is another enemy of joy. Comparison, well, they got this much and I only got this much. And what the Lord is saying, you know, be thankful. You know, Paul said, I'm content in whatever state I'm in. I'm content. I don't need a great big car. I'm going to tell you all something. I drive that Hyundai Azera out there at 14 years old. That bad boy has left many a Lexus on the side of the road. OK, I'm telling you. And I'm content. Shoot I need to go get my seat fixed right now, but that bad boy runs, okay? So I'm content with what I got, and I, I especially like the fact that it's paid for, all right? So, so, so <laughs> you have to remember what we have and be thankful to the gracious God who provided it to us. 
And then the third thing, remember what was paid. We were not rescued from this sinful life with money or with jewels, but we were rescued by God through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Now our hearts are filled with joy for the lamb who was slain. So I said all of that to say what? We can't buy joy. You know, joy doesn't come from somewhere else. True joy, the joy that is exhibited, comes from our relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we have that joy, you know, there's a song that, that the little kids used to sing. I got a joy, 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 joy. Where? <laughs> Down in my heart. And see, that's the foundation that's laid from the time we're this high. We're taught, I got a joy down in my heart and nobody can take it away. Why? Because it comes from Jesus Christ and my relationship with him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to speak to your family, Lord. Just thank you for allowing me to be an instrument by which to get your message across. Lord, I'm praying that if, there, if there's someone here today that has heard your word, that their ears perked up and they might want to know about this joy. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so now I want to offer to you an invitation. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I just offer you to come forward. Just raise your hand even right where you are. If you want to know him, that's all you have to do. If you want to know, just slip your hand up and I'll have one of these gentlemen or one of the ladies come over and talk with you. Or you may just be passing through, passing through, looking for a church home. I'm here to tell you that this is the church home for you because we serve a risen savior in here. And so, I say that to you and then finally you may be one who was in church at one time but you've kind of fallen away a little bit but that's all right because we serve a God who welcomes us all no matter what our situation no matter what our circumstances all we have to do is but look at the prodigal son who went away but when he came home his daddy threw a party for him because he was back home where he belonged. And that's the way the Lord is with us. We may fall away, but when we come back, he's standing there with open arms saying, welcome child, welcome home. Is there one? Anyone? If not, we've done as the Lord commanded. Let's sing a little bit of that. All to him. I surrender all. I surrender all yeah, I surrender all All to Thee, my blessed Savior I surrender all. Let's give God praise this morning. Did I miss anything? And I apologize, guys, that I didn't have the slides up there, but, but maybe next time. <laughs> Did we miss anything?